So today I am going to give you other flavors, flavors of decision making and repetition. So you see all the flavors. I'm going to give you different ones. Um, so you can actually select with the, for, uh, the one that suits you better. And we're going to have an introduction to arrays to understand what arrays are. Um, and um, that's it. So uh, we're going to go through these things and then uh, after we have done, we, we are done with the race, we're going to learn how we can actually have uh, uh, words inside a program, complete words like your name, sentences, things like that. We can actually receive it. So we'll see how that works. Now that we know all the functions, how the functions work, works and all those stuff, that's uh, what we are going to do. Um, before we begin, any questions? No questions. All right. Good morning. Anyone who comes late will get a personal good morning from me. <laughs> All right. So um, uh, again, um, I'm creating an empty project. Uh, so the very first thing I do, as I mentioned, before I do anything, I right click. I did that already, so you didn't see it. I pull it. So the uh, repository is pulled. And then after it's pulled, uh, I create a new project in it and I start the work. So Seneca, IPC144, I'm going to go over here in notes and that's going to be 06 today. So I'm going to say select folder, name it 06 dash February 8, and make sure that this check mark is marked. Create, wait for three years, and it's going to come up. And today I'm going to introduce something new to you um, about uh, reusing code. Add existing item. I want to see if we have something from previous day that might be useful. So we have utils.c. I'll bring it in. If you want to reuse something from previous times, you cannot just go to the previous directory and add it. You have to copy first the current project and then add it. So as you see, I'm going to copy this. Then I'm going to go back up, go to the current project, paste. Now I can add it. OK? So I'm going to add that one. Well, there was nothing in it. I thought I actually have something. Yeah, anyways, it's an empty one. Well, we'll use it. Doesn't matter. I'll create a new one today. And I'm going to add new item. Obviously, include IO stream. And I don't know if I'm spelling this right, but define CRT uh, no. CRT secure no warnings, right? Secure no war. Is it warnings or warning? Warnings. warnings. Thank you. All right. Uh, oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Say that C. Ah, don't look at it. <laughs> Standard input output.h. Int main void. Oh, yeah, void. That's correct. Return zero. Print out. Uh, OP, mm, IPC, IPC 144NBB, uh, 06 uh, February 8th, new line. Run and compile it, make sure it works so we can begin. And done. So let's start. So we talked about different types of things for repetition and all this good stuff that we had. Uh, so repetition that you are doing, uh, it, it, it is simply done through uh, the while loop that we write. So a while loop essentially checks for a condition and repeats the block that is coming after. Okay, We could have a block or a statement. It doesn't matter. So this is something that I'm going to tell you, and then I'm going to say don't do it. Okay, so first I'm going to tell you that you can, then I'm going to tell you don't do it. 
Okay? So I can write something like this. So I can have integer i set to 0. Now I can say while i less than 10 in here. What I can do in here is to do something like printf i percent d and a space, and I'm going to print, put i, and I put plus plus right in there. So, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to add one to i right over there. We said if you add plus plus to a, to a variable, it adds one to it. It's a shortcut, shorthand writing for the thing. And we're going to do more stuff like that too. So if I run this program, we know that it's going to, and I'm going to do a printf afterwards. If you are printing one character, use put char. Don't write printf percent c, yada, yada, yada. This is the job of put characters to put one character. It's easier to do it. But it's a character, you put single quotes around it, not double quote. Double quote is for series of characters. If I run this program, that works and that we, we learned that. So we start from, okay? Now, if it's only one statement, because you will see that code, you can do this. There is no problem with this. Because it's only one statement, you don't need to package the block afterwards. So if I run this, it works the same way. You see that? But don't do it. And I'll tell you why. We have two brains, not one. We have one brain that thinks and makes decisions. We have the second one down here that does automated stuff, like real breathing, right? Anything that you repeat after a while from your brain goes to the other one. I don't know what is the name in English, quite frankly. So, <laughs> so, so. No, no, not subconscious. Yeah, you can call it, it goes to your subconscious, okay? Like walking. Like when you walk, you walk. You don't think about it. You do, right? Try this once. Say that I'm going to walk for what? 50 meters, but I'm going to make sure I'm not going to have equal steps. By the time you go at the end of 50 meters, it's as if you ran for 20 kilometers because you have to keep controlling what you're doing. You follow what I'm saying? Okay. That happens with our eyes. When you are reading something that is written in order, and it's orderly, and it's always the same, while you are reading, your eye jumps automatically to the next thing, as if you are walking through your subconscious. When you have unorganized, irregular code, your eyes, without you knowing, has to look for the beginning of the next thing. It doesn't jump to it directly. Because of that, after half an hour of programming, you feel your brain is fried. And you don't know why. You think, you think oh my god, C is difficult. It's not. It's not C. You are not just organized. Your eyes keep looking for the next thing. And that's very, very tiresome. Because of that, although I could have written it like this, and many people do, That still works, but don't, because it's not normal. It's not organized. It's not what it's supposed to be. Always, for anything that needs a block, put a block, even if it's only one, because your eyes are used to this. Always stick to one style and follow it. It doesn't have to be your style. When you are going to a company, and get used to this, the style of programming that you're so fond of, as soon as go to, your, to, to a company, it's down the drain. They give you a manual and they say, this is how you code. If you don't, you're fired. It's not like you have a choice. Oh, I like to name my variables like that. No. They ask you to do like this. Why? Because the whole company is following that. They want everybody to be able to debug and maintain your code. So you have to follow everyone's style of coding. But again, because it's the same thing, after 10 minutes of looking for it, from your brain it goes back here, and your eye can really follow it. Okay? So that's my style of coding. Sadly, you're stuck with mine. Okay? But as soon as you get out of the world and you want to see something better, by all means do it. I have, the code that we are writing is not that complicated. So if I see students are not following my style, but they are following a strict style of their own, I still don't mind. Okay, I give you that little bit of liberty. 
but stick to one style and always follow that. Otherwise, you're going to hate programming without knowing why. You think that it's not me, but it's, that's not the case. Just because you feel tired after doing it, you're, you feel bad. Okay, it's like, you know what I mean, right? Things that make you tired, you don't want to do. So that's that. So the condition comes before the while loop, correct? So while loop may never happen if the condition goes wrong, correct? Sometimes you want things to happen at least once before you can check something, correct? For those type of things, we can, by the way, all these different flavors of repetition that I give you, they are all done with while. There's no difference. You can do it. So if I want this to at least happen once, all I need to do is to make the condition to be true first time and then change it after. There is no problem. But if you don't want to do that, this is what you do. So to separate them, I'm going to put it in different functions. So in here, I'm going to say uh, void while loop. And I'm going to say int count. So how many times I, I want to do it, OK? So for a while loop, this is what we have done. I'm going to put the example here. And this is going to be count. And I'm going to put over here. Oh, we need an integer i over here. Integer i set to 0. OK? So, uh, and, and let me take that i++ plus plus out of there, because I, because I wanted to show you that's what I did. And I'm going to tell you something about plus plus. Plus plus looks very cute and nice, but it's very tricky, OK? Plus plus and minus minus. Plus plus adds 1, minus minus reduces by 1. But to put it after the variable or before variable, completely different story. I'll explain it to you in a second, OK? But anyway, so in here I'm going to say, or you can use another shorthand which is like this. So if I have something like uh, i is equal to i plus 1, you can say i plus equal 1. People who wrote C language were true programmers. They didn't want to type too much. OK, you just want to have shorthand for everything. So if you want to just add something, you don't want to do i is equal i plus, you do that. And that applies to multiplication, to division, to uh, modulus to uh, uh, subtraction to all of them so so essentially let's put it like this if I if I if I if you have an operator like this uh, you can actually do it like that so I replace it with add sign add sign is no operator you know that okay so I'm gonna say over here replace at with And what is the other one? Uh, modulus. Any of these. You can use any of these. So, and that's not, so let's, and in here I'm going to put n, and that's n. So anything, you write something is equal to something, operator, you can just do it like this. Uh, count is equal to count plus num. Then you can say count plus equal num instead of that. So that's a shorthand thing for it. Just be aware of it. So in here, I'm going to say i, I plus equal 1 just for the heck of it. And, and I run the program. It works the exact same way we know it. For, uh, oh, because I didn't call it, it's not going to work the other way. I have to call it, actually. So while loop. And I'm going to put over here 10. OK? So that's going to do the 10 thingy, right? Now, if you want at, for this to at least happen once, so, so now if I actually put something like um, 10 in here, I'm going to do while loop again. I'm going to put over here minus 10. Obviously, the second one is not going to do anything, right? Because the condition goes false, right? The condition goes false. Are we all OK that I have written this function? I'm not confusing anybody, am I? We know that, right? And because I wrote it at top of main, I don't need to put a prototype for it because it's being compiled before main. Obviously, if you want to make it organized, we can always 
bring it down. Sorry, didn't want to do that yet. We can always bring it down and change that to a prototype just to make it organized. Okay, so that's why loop. If you want something to happen at least one, you can move the condition to the end of the while instead of beginning. So what you can do is this. So instead of while loop, you can have what we call a do while. So I'm going to call this do while. So with do while, you just take the condition, you bring it at the end. But because you have to start it with something, you put a do at the beginning. So you're saying, do the following while that condition is this. It's the exact same thing. So you're saying, so if I now do the do while thingy in here, and I need to put the prototype at the, at the top, So if I do the do while here, if I say do while, and I put over here 10, you will see that the result would be the same. But the difference is that if I now say do while minus 10, what happens is this. So take a look at that. So let's walk through it. I'm going to just come over here. And this is how you debug. I'll bring the mouse where I, at the left side, the, the, the border over here, where I want it to stop. I put it over there. That's a stop sign. Now, instead of Control F5 that compiles and run, I press only F5. F5 means debug. So it runs and whoop, stops out here and waits for me to go through it. If you forget what are these, you click on debug, it tells you. Start debugging, F5. Start without debugging, control, F5. Okay? And then it says over here, step into is 11, step over is F10. So, so I'm going to do this, actually. I'm going to put it over here, and I'm going to press F5. It runs, and poof, it stops over there. You see that? Now I'm going to bring this at left, and the output at right, and you see that it actually printed it, and it's waiting for this. Okay? If I press F10, it runs the whole thing. It's not going to step into the function. So if I press F10, you will see that it runs the whole thing all at once. Poof. Oops. F10, and it runs it. You see that? The whole thing. But when I press F11, it goes actually inside the, the function. Now, inside the function, it says i is equal to 0. Then count is minus 10. I less than count. You see, I highlight it. I put the mouse over here. It tells me it's false. So you can walk through it step by step and see. I press F10 again. Obviously, nothing's going to happen. It just prints new line and gets out. With do while, I'm pre pressing F11 again. With do while, it comes in. It doesn't check any condition. It just goes to the first statement. Obviously, it's zero. It's going to print the zero. Add one and go over here. Now, I don't want to do 10 times of this. So I'm just going to bring the cursor over here, and I'm going to press F5 again. So it's going to go and stop. And it runs the whole thing and stops at the other one. OK? Now I press F10 again, and it gets out of the function. Now I'm going to do while minus 10. When I go inside, now we know that the count is minus 10. Because there is no condition at the beginning, it happens at least once. But as soon as it comes over here, that count is not going to be right, so it comes out. So as you see, do while happens at least once. Are we OK with this? Questions? Suggestions? Are we OK? You are list, look stressed. <laughs> Pardon me? Not only at least once. Not only, at least once. So with a while loop, because the condition at the, is at the beginning, you know what it looks like? If I say, come in class, see if I'm there or not. OK? You're going to come. The door is coming or open. You come into class. So you come into class if I'm there or not, right? But if I told you, come in class, but I locked the door, you can't even come in. 
When you have the condition at the beginning, you can lock it right from the beginning so it never happens. But when you have the condition at the end, it has to pass through everything to reach the condition. Therefore, it happens at least once. So if you want to do something first and check, you can use do while. You can still use while, but with while, you have to think of, I have to set the condition true, make sure it goes in. But with do while, you just, if you have, like for example, if you want to do uh, foolproof data entry, do while is your friend. Because to do foolproof data entry, first you have to get the information from the user and entry, write it. So that's do while. So that's one thing. Again, as long as I'm concerned, just use the while loop. I don't care. Okay, they're all the same. It's just different flavors. If you use the other one, fine. Now, you can go to a restaurant. You can order, say, I want a burger. I want some fries and a Coke. And they bring it for you, right? Or you go to Wendy's. You say, I want combo number one. Poof, everything comes, right? We have that one. So for a loop, we have a combo two. Okay? So that combo is literally the translation of a regular while loop. So a regular while loop, what does it do? Let me actually bring it over here, and I'm going to call it void for loop. So with this, whoa. So with this for loop of mine, so What are you doing over here? You are setting a variable to something. Then you are checking. Then after everything is done, you are adding one to the counter, right? For loop does that on at the first line, so you don't have to write it. So with a for loop, you say integer i. Then you say for i set to 0 and i less than count and i, pl I plus equal 1. Then you write it. The translation of this one is exactly this, which means first only once. So, so for loop is this. For only once. Once at the beginning. Once at the beginning. Then condition. Then at end of at end of each loop. Loop. And then it goes. So actually let's do it like this. That's how a for loop works. It runs, what the, did I do that? How did this happen? Oh, that's, oh, I'm looking at the wrong. Was I just hallucinating? I think I was. Yeah, I don't know. Anyways, wow, okay. Anyways, so, yeah, so this happens only once. Then the condition is checked every single time. And at the end of the loop, that happens. So if I write over here the exact same thing, it works, ex it works exactly like that. And if I write for loop, so for loop is like a, It's exactly like a while loop, which means it may never happen. If the condition is wrong, it's not gonna it's not gonna run. You see that? So the second one. So the second one that has minus ten uh, doesn't print anything. And I I think I forgot to put a new line at the end. Yeah. Or put care.
I don't know who suggested to, I don't know, see, things like this is the worst thing, that when you actually put one, it puts two for you sometimes. I hate it. I'm sorry. It's just, I don't know who invented that thing. I thought so. As you see, the second one is doing nothing. So if the second loop is, is called, the second for loop is called and does nothing. So for loop like while loop works that way. That's repetition. All different flavors of repetition, pick one and use it. Uh, I don't force you to use any of them. You just need to know how they work, okay? So if I ask you how a for loop works, let me know. But you don't have to use them. While loop is fine, as long as I'm concerned, as, as far as I'm concerned, okay? So that's that. So loop flavors. Questions down to this point? Suggestions? Yes. You can put it inside, but that's a tricky thing. Don't, because it, don't for now. You will see many people do that. You asked it, I have to say now. So many people don't put it over there and put it inside. The thing is that, now, if you print I outside, will you have the I? Some compilers yes, some compilers no. So it's not a portable thing. In recent uh, releases of C, they say when you write in inside the for loop, it only has meaning inside the for loop. After that, integer is gone. You can't use it. But if you are using an old compiler, then it will think that it is created before and after while it's still alive. So if you write a code like this, okay, and run it, in here it works. If it's an older compiler, it's going to give you an error, tell you I is already in, uh, created. You cannot have two I's. So depending on old compiler or new compiler, it's not going to be portable. Let's not do it. Let's bring the I out, and it works the same way. So it doesn't matter. Put I over here, and still you can do it. There is no problem with this. Just because it's not portable. Especially with C, you've got to be careful about these things because the language is as old as it can get, right? So sometimes you write a code and it's, and it's compiled on a compiler that it's 20 years old, and then the things that are new won't work. And you say, I want that new compiler because my code doesn't work. They say, for that, you need to go through five different departments and get the, the I don't know. It's not easy. But when you are at certain place, you need to know what, your, what is your compiler and do it that way. Safe ways to do it like this, that works everywhere. Okay? So that was the answer to your question. So now, now that we know that, decision making. Decision making. So, the code we have written to print different marks, A, B, C, D, as we went through. We said if, the, if it's within this boundary, it means this. If it's within that, so the one that we, it was grade, right? Character grade we wrote. Was it grade? Yeah, and then we had over here integer value. Okay, we had that thing, right? So how did we write it? So we said over here, if, uh, first of all, I'm going to put over here. M, I'm not going to, so this is how it works. I. I put it here, 
And now I'm going to say character grade int mark out of 100. Remember that? So the way we, like, I thought that you might do is to check to see if values are okay. So first of all, whenever you have a function that returns something, the standard way of writing is to say character over here G and set it to some unvalid thing that you have, and you say return. And then you, now you start thinking, okay? Always do it that way. So I created everything. Now, now let me see how can I decide what that G is going to be. First of all, if it doesn't match my my criteria, it's going to remain x, so x is returned and mission accomplished. And uh, if it matches the criteria, the, the value is going to change and I'm going to have the proper thing out. So, in here I'm going to say if m is greater than or equal to 0 and m is less than, what was that, uh, 50, we said that g is set to f, right? And then we copy this, and now I'm going to say if it's greater than or equal to 50 and less than 60, right? Then that's a d. And I keep going like that, right? And because the conditions are created in an exclusive value way, it's impossible for it to get different things. So if I go like this, and that's, what is the other one? This is EF, uh, e, mm. e, this one is C, right? And I keep going like that. So if this happens, because the other conditions are exclusive, I'm sure they're not going to happen, right? Well, wait a minute. If it's greater than 0, and less than 50. So let's do it the other way. If I say in here, if it is greater than 0, and first of all, let's check to see if it's less. So I'm going to change the, the tone. And I'm going to say, if it's greater than 0 and less than that one, it is 50, right? Then, I'll just, how do I explain this so it goes right? Uh, let's do it like this. I'm going to say if m is less than 0, g is x. I'll remove that one. OK? So disrespectful. So what the devil is an else if over there? I didn't do that. Did it write it by itself? Anyways. So if it is less than 0, g is that. If it's not less than 0, what does it mean? It means it's greater than 0, right? So I'm going to say over here, else. So anything happens in here, it means it's a positive value, correct? So now in here, I can write another if statement. And in this if statement, I say, if it is less than 50, then g is f, correct? Right? So it comes over here. It, if this is true, the next is the rest is not going to happen, correct? And it says so, but if it is if this is false, it means it's, it's greater than or equal to zero. I come over here. In here, it means M is greater than or equal to zero for sure. Correct? And then in here we're gonna go else. Now at this place, it is 100% sure that it is greater than or equal to 50, correct? Right? Are we okay with this? 
So now in here I can write another if, oh my goodness, another if. Now in here I, I can say if m is less than 60 and an else. Now in here I'm going to say g is set to d. OK? Doing that, there is guarantee that m is greater than or equal to 60 after this, right? So in here, I can write another if statement, m less than 70. As you see now, the conditions don't have to be two, because each one is in the else of the other one. So I don't have to write two conditions. If it passes that one, then the rest has a specific value that I can test on. Okay, and I can keep going like this, and it becomes very confusing. They created a routine for this, so you can select one out of many. Okay, they came up with something, so you can select one. So instead of this ginormous thing that we're going to write over here, so in here it's going to be G is going to be C. Should I complete it and bore you to death? Uh, I'm not going to do it. And the rest. Instead of doing this ginormous thing, I can do it this way. So I'm going to remove it. I'm going to comment it. Character grade. And I can write it like this. I'm going to say character G. I'm going to say if m is less than 0, the exact same way, OK? Obviously, g is going to be f, lx, because it's invalid, right? Else. Now, instead of writing another thing, you simply write an if over here, and you put the next condition. So else if, in here, I'm going to say m less than 50, right? That's going to be g is equal to f. And I can continue this. And I can make this one 60, 70, 80, 90, and 100. Obviously, that's going to be less than or that's going to be less than or equal to 100. OK? And I'm going to set the proper thing. So this is going to be D, C, B, A, B, C. Oh, F, 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 F. F, D, C, B, A. And this is going to be the plus thingy that we were talking about, right? And then at the end, I'm just going to put a single else. OK? And here, I'm going to say g is x again. So having this type of thing, else if, else if, else if, else if written, it means the compiler is going to check all the conditions. The very first one that is hit, that's going to happen, and the rest won't. OK? So selection of one of many happens like this. That's much easier than nested ifs. It's, it's much easier like this. You write, so remember this thing. If you have 10 conditions that you want to check, and you want to only choose one of the 10 conditions, this is what you do. Easy and straightforward. So you simply uh, write if, else if, else if, else if. You put the conditions that you want and the block. Any of these happen, the rest will be completely ignored. If none of the conditions are met, the last one is going to happen. That doesn't have a condition. If it is impossible for last one to, oh, I, I, I forgot my, I took my plus out. This is a good thing. You can just do it like this. C 
So that's the plus one, okay? So if none of these happen, else happens. If your conditions cover everything and it's impossible for else to happen, then you can just ignore it, not put this one. It doesn't make any difference. So if you have an else, you're going to have one of many conditions or else. If you don't put this one, it's going to be one or none. Okay? That's the, uh, the if-else statement. So that's another way of writing uh, um, selections like that. So doing something like this is going to be one of many or else. And if else, okay? If else does not exist, it will be one of many or none. Okay? Okay? So one of many or else, the other one's going to be one of many or none because you don't have an else at the end. Are we okay with this? Okay, that's different types of, so this is an if-else thingy that you want to do. So if I, if I uh, write my code over here, I can, I can do something like this. I can say, now I'm going to use a for loop. I'm going to say character ch. I'm going to say for ch set to a. Yes. Uh, oh, no, no, no. I, I wanted to do that. No, 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 no. Sorry, 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 sorry. The other way. That's for the other one, not this one. Forget about it. That's the other one. So now in here, I'm going to say uh, integer mark set to minus 10, minus, minus 1. And in here, I'm going to say uh, mark, mark set to minus 1, mark less than 100 and 2 and uh, mark plus plus. Now in here I'm going to say uh, printf percent c and a space and then I'm going to put over here grade of mark. So grade will directly return the thing in printf and at the end I'm going to say put care uh, a new line. So running this will go through the if else statement and print all the things. So it starts from x, goes up to whatever we have. Are we okay with this? Are we okay? All right. So that's if else. Now, if what you have if what you have requires equality check, which means you have one value and you want to see if this value has certain, uh, uh, if you have a variable and you want to know if this variable have cert it has certain value, you have to do something about it. If that's the case, we have another type of decision making set. Uh, so uh, let's say I want to do something like this. I'm going to say integer mark, and in here I'm going to receive a, a character grade. And I would say if the person gets an F, that's a zero. If the person gets a, a, a D, that's a, it gets me, I'll, I'll give them uh, 59. If they get a, uh, I give them 59. And, and I keep going like that. So I want the maximum possible value for the grades given, something like that. So if I want to do that, so in here, in this mark of mine, let me just copy. I want to check for equality. It's not that it's going to be between this and that. I want to see if the grade is A. I want to see if the grade is B. And I want to keep going like that. So if that's the case, this is the uh, decision-making structure that you can write. It's, it's called a switch statement. So essentially, it switches to different 
uh, actions based on the value of grade. You cannot check conditions. You cannot say if the grade is between this and that. It only checks for equality. You can say if grade is A, if grade is B, only checks for equality. How does it work? You say switch to the value of grade. And then you write over here case, in case this is an A. Or let's start for plus. In case, that's that one. And you put a column in front of it. And then you say over here, break. And you continue these things, as many as you want. So case A, case B, C, D, F. OK? And then at the end, you say default. Default means if none of those happen, any other value. OK? And in here. So, so again, I have to say int uh, m. And I'm going to say return m. Now I'm going to say if it's a plus, I'll give it 100. M is 100. If it's A, M is 80. Uh, 89. I'm just coming up with stuff. Maximum A that you can get. If it's B, M is 79. If it's C, M is, uh, what do I want to do? Uh, 69. If it's D, M is 59. If it's F, M is 49. OK? And the default, I'm going to put, I'm going to put M is minus 1, something impossible. And I write the code. So now, depending on what the values are, so I can write over here. Now I can write CH. And I write over here. CH being equal to A. A do while is actually good for this. Forget it. I'm not going to write the complicated thing. So, so now I'm going to say CH less than or equal to F. And I'm going to say CH minus minus. percent D. I'm going to put the mark in here, and I'm going to pass the CH. But in here, I'm going to write something crazy. I'm going to write printf percent D and mark with plus, because plus is something that I cannot put it in there. So you can put two things at the beginning of the for loop, as long as you separate them with a comma. It's just a statement, right? So I'm going to say, this is happening only once, right? This is happening only once. So it's going to first print f percent and calls the mark passing the plus, right? Or I could bring it out if it's too confusing. You can, we'll run them both. So now, let me just bring it over here, bring it out. You already can put it over here like this. So now, CHA goes like this, and one by one it prints them out. And when I run the program, eight for each one, wow, it's all minus one. What did I do? Let me see if I made them boo boo. Uh, oh. Oh, plus, 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 yeah. There we go. And it's still, uh, am I doing something wrong in here? Let's see what I'm doing wrong. Good, actually. Now, let's, let's walk through it. So I'm going to uh, press F10. I'll come over here. It passes the plus. Grade is plus. It comes over here. M becomes 100. It uh, does that and skips everything else. You see that it jumps to the end, returns 100 and prints it out. 
I think I forgot to put a space over here. Let's do it one more time. So again, F10. Bring it over here. This one goes at right. I'll come to here, F11. I go to mark. Grade is plus. Sets it, comes out, returns it, and prints it. That's 100. Then starts from A. CH is A. Calls the mark. So that's A. It jumps to A, makes it 89, comes out, prints 89 goes up, now CH is B, 79, 69, 59, minus 1, minus, and goes 49. So because we don't have between D and F, that's the minus 1 that happens, okay? So it's A, B, C, D, E, there is no mark like that. So it prints a minus 1 and it works, okay? So that's how switch statements work. Again, like an else if statement that we talked about, Lots an else, like an else if statement, if you don't put the default, it means so with default, it's selection of one or else. With no default, it's selection of one or none. Default essentially means, so again, remember, these check for equality. Okay, remember, these check for equality only. And you can use it that way. So these are uh, switches. Are we okay with this? Okay, there's one thing you need to please remember. You see this break? You see it, programmers use it other places in C language. You're not allowed to. Never, ever you use break unless you're using it in switch. Okay, so there are three things that you will see that you are not allowed to use in my code. Go to, you're not allowed to use. Continue, you're not allowed to use. Break you're not allowed to use. Break, continue, go to, forbidden. Okay? I'll tell you why. When the computer languages began, dinosaur's time. Okay? The logic wasn't like this. You could come over here, execute, and you could say, now go to line number 50. It would literally jump to number 50 and continue. Then you could say, go to line number 29. It would go back to 20. So you could go to, to anywhere you want. They loved it, okay? Then what happened was a spaghetti code, which means you couldn't trace where the program go. So programs, as long as it was very sm uh, uh, small, they were manageable. And then they went bananas, okay? So they said, from now on, go to is forbidden. We are not using it. It is in the language because language is coming from dinosaur's time, but you're not using it. Number two, continue jumps to the end of a loop. So essentially, if you are writing a loop, if, I, if I'm writing a for loop with 50 lines of code, halfway through I say continue, it skips the rest and goes back up to the beginning of the loop, which is essentially a go-to to the end of the loop. So another go-to, we are not using it. There is nothing that you cannot fix it with an if statement. If you want to go to, simply write, if you want to continue, write if this, do that, otherwise don't do something. So it makes it structure. Break is even worse. Break halfway through the loop without the condition this discontinues your loop and comes out. An unconditional break. Again, another go-to. Do not use it. So break, continue, go-to was abandoned 30 years ago. You use it now, it's like, oh my God. Okay, don't. So we are, we are learning this, and after this, I'm going to tell you, next semester, I'm going to tell you, this is chaotic. Let's do object-oriented. Even this is not done now that we are learning, but you need to learn it to code. After this, we're going to move to object orientation. So this is 30 years ago till 15 years ago. Now, we're going to switch this next semester to current time, okay, which is 15 years ago till now. Okay, so please, uh, no break, no continue, no go to. And you are allowed to have only one return statement in your function, not two. Again, if you have a return statement halfway through your function, what does it mean? Go to the end, right? 
anything that translates to go to, you're not allowed to use. Each function must have one point of entry, one point of exit. That's it. So you should always remember, I'll put this rule, return must be the last statement in your function. That's it. It's not allowed to be anywhere else. Figure out how to do it. Okay? All right. These are important stuff that helps you not to shoot yourself in the foot in the future. Anyway, so that's switch statement. Again, so again, another flavor. All these things can be done with if else. Okay? Uh, else if can be done with if else, but it becomes too nested and it's difficult. So anyways, you know. Uh, and that's the whole thing. Done. Finished. We don't have anything else. Okay? We have a little thing called conditional statement we'll talk about later, but uh, a another shorthand for an if statement. Um, So let me do switch. Alt F. Since I'm doing all flavors, let's do that too. So I'm going to say over here switch dot C. And when we do this, then we go for a break, okay? This is week five, right? We are in week five now, correct? Am I mistaken? Week five. Pardon me? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. I mean, like, timely, not yeah. workshoply. <laughs> week five. We are in week five, yeah. Don't worry. We have, like, eight workshops, so uh, we are okay with workshops. Well, <laughs> you're going you're gonna to have lots of workshop coming and, and the project and stuff. Don't worry about it. You'll be fine. Um, so that was switch. So let's say... I'm not going to talk about con conditional statement is a very short type of if statement running. It's basically one of the inventions of C2. Write an if statement in one line semicolon at the end. Okay, so, so it's very quick type of writing the thing. I'm going to teach it when the time comes and I find it necessary. You don't need to do it now. For now, do your if, if thing. Yeah, and when the time comes and I see I can write it in a more cute way using that, we'll go with So I'm not going to teach it now. I, this, I think this is enough different flavors of decision making and, and repetition. And that's it, OK? So uh, let's go for a break, come back, and then we're going to talk about uh, other things. And I'm going to pause the recording. So I want to teach you something about reusing your code. I want to teach you something about reusing your code. Um, we said like we can write like, for example, getting, a, um, getting an integer. We wrote a function called get int, right? We wrote over here int, get int. Something like that. And in here we said scanf percent d. We're going to fix that right now. So this is what we did to write, to get one integer and return it. OK? And we said to reuse this, I can go to my main, that is prg.c, and in here I can add that prototype in here. And say over here, and 
say value is set to get int. OK? So I'm essentially writing my functions in one file. I am using it in another. Remember this? And when I run the program, because I told this guy that get int is there, let me see. Oh, scanf, I need to put the scanf for the other one too. So that becomes a separate module of its own. And now I say enter a number. I'll go 20. It says you enter 20. The problem is that when this thing gets more and more, let's say now I want to get a double. So I'm going to say double get dbl, let's say, and I do the exact same thing over here. So I'm going to say uh, integer uh, double num scanf percent lf address of num, and I'm going to say return num. Again, these are very simple things. Soon we're going to change it to foolproof. If I want to use this get double, then I have to copy this and I put it back over here, right? To be able to reuse it. So now I can use the get double thingy. The problem is that if your utils file have 50, fu 50 functions in it, you have to go one by one, select, and keep printing prototypes in. That's mind-numbingly hard and difficult. It would have been nice if I could all together bring all the prototypes of the function utils, of the module utils, and include it to the top of this one with one command. The answer is that we have that. So what you can do you can create for each, and remember, for each C file of yours, you should add another file. That its job is to introduce your C file only and nothing else. We call that a header file. So all your files need that except the one that has main in it. That doesn't need it because it's just Main is only going to be used by operating system to run. No other one is going to use it, right? So the one that has main, I'm not talking about that, but any other mod module, you go to header files, you add a new item, and you call it, you put over here, where is it, header file, and you, you name it exactly like the other one. So you call it utils.h instead. OK? Forget that pragma once. OK? Remove that one. Or you can let it be for now. For now, let it be. It doesn't matter. It's possible that it's not going to compile on, uh, on matrix, but we'll see. Then you put all your prototypes for your functions that you have in utils in here. So it's easy. I'm just going to copy the whole function. I'll put it over here. And I just take the body out. and take the body out, OK? So as you see, this is, these are just prototypes for all the functions that I have in here. Now, in your program, instead of writing that, you can simply say include utils.h, but with double quotes. Done. By doing something like this, you automatically bring all the prototypes in here. Give me two seconds. Include literally. Literally means copy and paste. Literally. So it literally takes the file that you have, utils.h, copies the inside, and pastes it over there before compilation. And then you're done. So I don't, I simply, simply say in, include utils.h, and I'm going to bring all the things that I have in that one. And I can reuse it from project to project, workshop to workshop. If I'm going to get an integer again, why should I write the code again? You will see, I'm going to write, I'm going to make it foolproof now. 
and you will see it's lots of work to make it foolproof and to bring the function over and over from one to another, it becomes difficult. Yes? After this, from now on, you will see that you're going to have two options of submission. You either write, you either write uh, 144W3P1 for part one, or you write 144W3UP1. If you put UP1, then it includes that one in it too for your submission. So you can choose which one to, if you don't want to do it this way, don't. But I strongly suggest, if the workshop requires it, obviously there is no UP1. If I ask you to have a utils, then you have to put it, okay? So now, foolproof, foolproof reading. I don't think we can get to uh, arrays today. It's gonna be next week. Anyways, it's on week six anyways. but. Foolproof entry. First, we have to understand how the entry on your uh, on your uh, how the entry on your uh, uh, keyboard works. Your keyboard is the lineup to get coffee at Tim Hortons. That's how it works, literally. Okay, every single hit that you do on your keyboard, every single hit is one person standing in line to the order of those hits. And somebody at the end of the line is serving them one by one. So if the fourth one that is over there has an order of 900 coffees, the rest will stand in line for a long time. It's always like that. And if somebody stands in line and doesn't go, the rest cannot get their coffee. That's called buffered entry, anything that is buffered. Buffered is a temporary place that you put the stuff before you take it and use it. So when you type your stuff, it all lines up in your keyboard, all of them. And then, one by one, it's served. There is one good thing about this. That is, when you want to enter, say, 10, what are the keys you hit on your keyboard? No. If you want to enter 10, what are the keys you hit on your keyboard? No. If you want to enter 10, what are the keys that you hit on your keyboard? No. I'll give 2% to the first mid to, to your midterm if you tell. No. <laughs> See, you are, you, are, you, are, you are talking like a user. Please put your programmer hat on. A programmer hat on, it means turn your intelligence to off, be dumb as a doorknob, then think, what do you do when you hit 10 on your, key, on your keyboard? To enter 10. You hit, no, no, you hit, you hit one. Then what do you hit? Then what do you hit? Enter. When you enter 10, you put one zero, enter. Not one zero. You put one zero, nothing's going to happen. You have to sit over there for nine years. You have to hit that damn enter. Do we understand that? Anything you do on the computer, you do on a chat, you chat, then you hit Send. If you don't do that, nothing goes. Do we understand this? Do we understand this? That little thing that you hit at the end, it's enter, is called backslash n. That's its code. So single code, backslash n, single code. It's a character that you don't see it. When you, when you print it, the cursor jumps to the new line. That's it. The good news is that all entries end to that. It's as if the person at the end of the Tim Hortons lineup always has a sign in his hand that I am the last person. Okay, so every single time you do, you know that the lineup ends at backslash n. Do we understand this? Okay. We use that to our advantage. Okay? 
First of all, we have scanf. Scanf reads things and converts them for us. So when you want to read an integer, you put one, two, three, and you hit enter. Scanf reads character one, character two, character three, does some magical math on it, converts it to number 123, and puts it in a four byte variable. That four byte variable, there is no one, two, three over there. It's a binary representation of 123 in there. There is no one, two, three. One is a character, two is a character, three is a character. That's not a number. A number is a binary thing in your computer, okay? That's what a magical thing the, the, the scanf is doing, okay? You can always read stuff as characters, which means they have no meaning. You have, a one is a shape that has an ASCII code. Two is a shape that has ASCII code. You can tell to scanf, get one, two, three, and you will percent LF. What does it mean? Get one, two, and three, convert it to a double, put it in eight bytes in the variable. That's why you always put address of in a scanf. You say, read this, put it in address of that variable. It converts it. But the good thing is that at the end of all this, what's going to be in the keyboard? What remains in keyboard that scanf doesn't read? No. Enter, backslash n. When you put one, two, three, and you hit enter, scanf reads it, and then that backslash n remains in your keyboard, always. Now if you put one, two, three, A, B, C, and you tell to scanf read an integer, scanf says one, oh, that's convertible to an integer. Two, that's convertible to an integer. Three, that's convertible to an integer. A, what the heck is that? I'm not going to read it. So it reads one, two, three, converts it to an integer. What remains in your keyboard is a, B, C, enter. There's garbage in there. You can simply remove that garbage by reading the characters until you hit backslash and right. That's called flushing the toilet. That's what we do with our keyboard for foolproof entry. We flush to make sure the keyboard's clean and empty for the next entry to come in. That's foolproof entry. In a foolproof entry, so, let me, let's tell you this one. I'm sorry that I give you this example, but when I give this example, usually it, it sinks. When you go to the washroom, what do you like to do? You go in there, you see, ugh, you flush, you do your work, you leave your stuff over there for next person to flush. Is that how you do it? No, it's always the other way. You do your stuff, you clean it after yourself, you get out so the next person goes, ah. They sit, do their work, they flush and go out. That's what we do. We read, we do stuff, we make sure that damn keyboard is clean for the next thing to come in. That's our holy grail. That's what we have to do. Done? Okay. Now, first, let's see. I'm going to write something over here. So, very first thing I want to write is, is a function. So we, we, we wrote put character to put a single character up, right? There is a function that works exact opposite. It gets one character from keyboard, so you don't need to do scanf. But that's raw character. It has nothing to do with what you enter. So, so what you do over here is this. It, has, it will not get processed. It, it has nothing to do with the value you want to enter. So it doesn't matter if you put a double. It doesn't matter if you put somebody's name. It doesn't matter if you put an integer or a single character. It reads everything as character. So I can write something like this. I can say. do, and in here I'm going to say while, ch is not equal to backslash n, character ch, and in here I'm going to say ch is equal to get char. Get char essentially means give me one character. Okay? Now if I run the program, this is what happens, right? I keep entering, okay? Nothing happens until I hit enter. When I hit enter, it reads them all and comes out. Let me show you. 
I'm going to say over here, put care, CH. So from what we see, it's as if I read one, I print one. I read one, I print one, correct? But let's see what happens. In here, I'm going to say, by the way, that's a new version of put care, poor care. OK, put care. So in here, I'm going to say put care, and I'm going to go to new line. So now if I run the program, see what happens. Do you see anything printed? No. They are all standing in a lineup because enter is not hit. The keyboard is not reading anything. It is literally standing at the first repetition of the for loop of the loop in here, waiting for enter to get hit. As soon as it hits, it will come, reads everything at the end, stops at the, at the new line and comes out. Take a look. And I hit enter and it goes. That's called buffered entry. And it stops because I hit backslash n. If I don't do that, the program hangs because it, it wants to keep reading. <laughs> okay? So that's your end of the story. We use this to clean up our keyboard. We're not going to print anything. So we literally put this thing over here. We literally write, get this code and put it in our utils. And we call it flush keyboard. Or let's call it just flush. Nah, flush has a thing. Uh, flush key. So I literally put this one over here, and I'll go character ch, and I'm not going to print anything. I don't want to do anything. I just want to keep reading and throw the garbage away. If it's only one character, one enter in it, fine. It comes in here, reads the one character, and that one character is new line and comes out. If it's five, if it's five million, the same thing is going to happen. So that flushes the keyboard. We call this function after we read whatever we want to make sure our keyboard is clean for the next person to read it, for the next function to read it. Are we okay with this? So that's our going out of the bathroom flushing, okay? Now let's see if it works. I want to see if I actually put the flush in here. Will it change anything for me? If I write over here flush keyboard, first of all, I put this thing, I better put it in a header file. Because you added a function, you add a header file. And remove this pragma once thing. I'm going to tell you something to write over here. And I need you, and I need you to memorize this. Let's finish this. And I'm going to tell you, you have to surround these two, this header file of yours, in something. And you have to memorize it. I'll tell you how to do it. I'll give you a pattern. You memorize it, and you put it over there. Then in OP244, you're going to comfortably use it because you memorized it. And in OP345, we tell you actually what it means. <laughs> OK. So, so it is something that uh, uh, one, of, uh, one of those things that, I, uh, that we always say that uh, uh, blindly follow until you learn. OK? So I'm going to say over here, flush key. And let's see if it actually works. I just read, I just read uh, an integer over there, right? So so I'll remove this one. I'm going to say integer num integer num actually n1 and n2. I want to show you something. n1 n2, okay? So in here I'm going to say printf n1 And then I'm going to say n1 is set to get int. As you see now, the IntelliSense actually show me I have that function. Why? Because I included the header file. OK? So I'm going to say get int. And I'm going to repeat the exact same thing over there with n2. And in here, I'm going to say printf uh, n1 is percent %d, and n2 is percent %d. 
and I'm going to put over here N1 and N2. Okay, very simple program to just check. What is this called from workshop three? What is this main called? A unit test. I am doing a unit test for my get in to see if I can later on use it. I write different tests. So if I run this program, first I'm going to run it normally. What did I do wrong? Oh, another beautiful thing that happened. See, all these errors, please cherish it. Do you see that I get an error in here that says missing semicolon? When I actually look at the error, it shows the main. You see that? Whenever you see something like this that it doesn't make sense, when you go, huh, what the heck? That means you made some mistake in your header file. Because header file is literally, as I told you, is copies and pasted over here. So if you make a mistake over there, the very next thing after that is where the compiler finds out there's something wrong. That's why you get the error message over there. Now I go back to my header file, and I see I forgot to put the semicolon in here. OK? Now I go back in. So let's run it one more time. So N1, I'm going to put 10. N2, I'm going to put 20. It worked. So that flush thing is really flushing that thing. But the difference is now is this. Take a look. I run it, and I put 10, and I hit Enter. And I put 20, and I hit Enter. Still, it reads it. Why? Because after it reads it, it flushes the toilet. Everything will go to dump. The keyboard is ready for the next thing to pick up. Do we understand this? Let's remove the flush and see what happens. Let's remove the flush and see what happens. So I'm going to remove the flush over here. OK? 10. The second one says, what the heck? I'm not going to go with this washroom thingy. You, you destroyed everything. I, I'm not going to go. I'm getting it. So because, because 10 was red, and the rest is leave in the keyboard, right? The second scan of comes in. What does it pick up? A. Is A an integer? No. It says, I'm not got reading this. I'm gone. We good? All right. That's flush. So let's actually add that one. Now, so how come it worked down to this point? How come if I don't have a flush and I write over here 10 and I hit enter and I put 20, it still works? It's white space. When you're standing in a lineup, and the next person is standing over there, and you're here. You remember COVID time when you had to go six feet thing? It's the thing. If it's white space to the next thing, you're going to keep going until you get it. So if things are white space, uh, Scanf says it's OK. It's not garbage. I can skip it. OK? That's why. So they call it leading spaces. I'll always ignore it. That's why it worked down to this point. But when the time comes when we want to actually do real data entry, you'll see that uh, we can actually even detect that one. So if somebody puts 10 space, we're going to say no space after. We can actually do that. OK? Questions down to this point? Yes? It is the same as keyboard enter. You cannot enter backslash n. The action of hitting enter is backslash n. And backslash n is the ASCII code 10. Because it doesn't have any representative in visible keys, they call it backslash n. Anything that starts with backslash, it means we don't have it on keyboard. This is the code. Backslash n essentially means new line. Backslash uh, B means backspace. So if you print backslash B, the cursor goes once back. Backslash R means next line, not necessarily new line. So on different compilers, it changes. In some, it jumps at the beginning. The other one just goes to the next line. It doesn't go to the beginning. Uh, and it, there are many different things that you can go. And that's the difference between FTP that you do. Like, you actually have to, in FTP, I, I don't know if in one of the courses that they cover these things, they tell you when you FTP, you have to select this as a text file. Uh, did anybody tell you that? They didn't tell you that, did you? 
Okay, forget about it, so I'm not going to go there. But anyways, all these things called escape sequences. An escape sequence are, are non-ASCII, not non-ASCII, non-printable, non-keyboardable uh, uh, characters that you want to somehow identify, okay? Questions? Yes. No, you just read and throw it away. You can store it in a program if you want. We'll teach you how soon. But if, if, you're, you're, if you want to say press Y for yes and for no, then get carries your friend. You read one character and you flush the rest to see if that's... Well. So, uh, you were saying? That's the whole beautiful thing about it. When you write a nice function that does your job perfectly, then you don't need to rewrite it over and over. You carry it with you from project to project. So you have to have these two. Remember, like when you're going to a, like you have a new workshop, you copy .h and .c in that workshop, and you simply use it. It's not like. It is creating your own library. OK? so. That standard input output dot h, go to find out, Google it and see where is it on your computer, open it up, it's just a header file. And it's being included, so all the prototype for printf, scanf, all the functions you're using are in there. But when you put less than and greater than, it means systems, it means compilers. When you put double code, it means custom, that's mine. So it looks at the directory, not the directory of the compiler. When you put less than and greater than, it goes to the directory that your compiler is installed and brings it from there. But when you put double code, it means current directory. Okay? Are we good? Uh, we have three minutes. I'm not going to continue with this, so next time we are coming in to the lab, uh, we'll, uh, to, to the lab at the beginning probably for, I'm going to spend 15 minutes to complete the foolproof entry so you see what it is uh, so we can design a foolproof entry like something that is like locked perfectly good. So I'm just going to teach you one thing and I want you to memorize this. You need to, pardon me? I'm going to open up the quiz tonight. You're going to have two quizzes open for you. Quiz one, I'm going to wipe out all the marks or make it two attempts, one of these two. So if you have a beautiful mark and you don't want to do it again, sure, don't do it. Um, so either two attempts or uh, wipe out everything. I have to see which one is easier on, on, on Blackboard. And I'm going to open up the second quiz. It's going to be unresponded, so you have to download and install Lockdown on your computer to be able to do it. Okay? So... Remember this. Remember what I'm doing in here. Seneca underline file name underline h. Remember this. This is a token you have to create to make your header file safe. And you have to add these around it. So this is what you write. You write, if not defined, it's, you see it actually creates its own. You write over here, se ne ka underlined. What is the name of the file? Utils, right? So I'll go utils underline h. Then you copy the whole thing and paste it again and you change the second one to define. Everything in your header file must be in the belly of this instruction. So you, have, you don't know, but this is, I'm, I'm telling you so you know it. A C program is not only one language. It's two languages combined. One language is the C program where you write your program. The second language is requests from compiler to do something before they compile your C code. Anything that starts with a hashtag is you talking to the compiler, telling to compile my code as such. 
writing that guarantees that if by mistake you include your utils two or three times, it only gets compiled once. So it makes it safe. So now if my utils is included 50 times, it comes, it says, is Seneca utils.h defined? No. First time compiling, it comes in. As soon as it comes in, it defines it, right? And compiles the whole thing. Goes away. The second time you, you include it, it asks the compiler, is that thing defined? It says, yes. So ignore everything. It's not going to compile it anymore. So that guarantees if you have this one 50 times. So whenever you are writing a header file, those two things should be done immediately. That's an empty header file. And then you put stuff in it. If not defined, define and end if at the end. That's it. Okay? So remember that. And have yourself a beautiful day.